podcasting from Chico, California, tucked in between some of Northern California's best freshwater fisheries. This is the Barbless Podcast, a podcast about NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fisheries management, and sustainability. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, leave the guys a voice message on the Barbless Podcast hotline, area code 530-636-2523. Also check out http colon slash slash podcast.barbless.co, where you can download past episodes and show notes. Be sure to follow them on Instagram at barbless.co and connect with them on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. Fish on. Hey, what's up, everybody? Before we start this episode with Val Atkinson, uh, we have a special announcement. So next week, so this is going to be July 12th on Friday, uh, friends of the show, Chuck Reagan and Hogan Brown are going to be playing live music at the Argus in Chico, California. Uh, the Argus location is uh, 212 West 2nd Street, Chico, California, 95928. You guys should come down, support them, and the and the uh, the rest of the, the band, the Royal Oaks, is which uh, I think that's... That's Hogan's band. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of us that are going to go to Crush Restaurant prior to the show. Uh, we'll be there around 6.30. We'll stay until, you know, right up until about 9 and then roll over to Argus to watch these boys jam. So hopefully you guys can be there. Uh, enjoy this episode. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. we got a special guest I want to introduce, but first, Chad, say hello. Hey, what's up, Nick? Are we we're still at Clearwater? Still at Clearwater. I'm working around. Not and Clear still Creek. At, Clearwater. No, Clearwater. Clearwater Lodge. <laughs> Michelle Titus is hosting us. She's been so nice. We're getting ready. Such for, a great place. Yeah, getting ready for the Five Waters Challenge, Five Rivers Challenge. Now I messed it up. Five Rivers Challenge, and we're we're kind of like in between uh, Fall River and Bernie. It's kind of like right in the middle, almost as a bird flies, um, right by Pit One Powerhouse, I think. Yep. Yep. Yeah. If you guys know where that is, uh, lodge is awesome. There's, it's if you guys uh, can do it, trying to get make a trip up here, well uh, worth it. We're gonna be going after hex on the on the fall. We're fishing McLeod. We're doing a bunch of stuff, so I can't wait. Um, so with us today is who? Who do we have, Nick? Mr. Val Atkinson, how are we doing, sir? Very well, thank you kindly. Thank you it's for an thank honor you. to be here. Yeah. And and Val's like a uh, world class fly fishing photographer, the OG fly yeah, fishing. Our first actually on the show, right? Yeah. We have hobbyists we've had on, but an actual guy that actually gets paid money to take pictures of fish. I want to know how the hell you got that job because that's pretty rad. Well, that's a long story. Should I start from the beginning or yep. start at the end and work no, backwards? Uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Well, let me start at the beginning and move up very quickly. So, grew up in the Midwest, fishing bass and catfish out of farm ponds. Cool. And there's no trout in Ohio. There is one trout stream, but I never went there. Um, grew up in a dysfunctional family, and I escaped as often as I could to go out and fish for bass, get away, a little peace and quiet. And grew up, went to high school, graduated Went to art school and studied photography and illustration. Where at? Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. Cool. That was 1965 to 1970. So after college, I tried to figure out, after art school, I tried to figure out how can I make a living with this photography gig? So I moved west because that's what people said, you know, go west, young man, go west. So I, California was about as far as I could go. and I dabbled in everything. I did architecture and babies and weddings and nudes and nothing really felt right. And then one day a friend of mine said, let's go fishing on Hat Creek, which is where we are right now. Yeah. Close to it. And I took my camera and we went up cause I'd always fished. And, and at this time I'd gotten into trout fishing and I photographed, documented what my group of friends camped out, what they did all weekend sent the pictures, they were black and white film, into Fly Fisherman magazine. This was about 1974. 
And they bought everything for black and white photo essay. And I went, holy, holy crap, that's what I'll become, a fly fishing photographer. <laughs> so I want to back up. Yep. Um, when you, you got out of high school in 65, you said? 64. Yep. 64. So the Vietnam War was raging. Right. Um, where there was a lot of like stills, like these black and white stills coming off the battlefield during that time. On Time Magazine, there's some iconic stuff. Um, you know, they covered almost a decade, right? Um, did any, were you, was there anything in there that affected your life in terms of like inspired you to maybe get into photography at all? Or was it, you know, it's, it's just a really interesting time to be growing up because you're like, you could get, you could be drafted, right? If you messed up in college, you could have easily got been drafted. Um, like, can you kind of talk about that time a little sure. bit? And I want to get back to this, but sure. this is a really, sure. it's sure. a good opportunity to kind of unbox a spot that maybe no one's talked to you about. Right. So, yeah. So, at the time the Vietnam War was going on, I was actually in art school, and I was worried that I was going to be drafted. Yeah, I little, would be too. Little kid from Ohio. Yeah. But coming from a roughneck, roughneck neighborhood in outside of Columbus, Ohio, it was a quota system. So we had enough guys that were gung ho to go and fight that I didn't have to go. So I never got called up. So I went, okay, well, that's, that's fine. That's fine. I can practice my photography. And about that time, Kent State was going on and that was in the papers. And the same thing was happening in Columbus, Ohio, where I was at art school and cops were throwing tear gas and college students were throwing bricks. And I went in and bought my first camera at a camera store. It was a Miranda. Mm -hmm. That brand has since gone out of business. And I went out on the street and documented what was going on. So was this like your first time then really doing documentary, do, document, documentary style pho- photography? Okay. I kind of had a feeling that might be the case. That's pretty cool. So that kind of, that, that kind of gave you the foundational stuff that you needed to be able to then be here in Bernie and document your that's, friends. That's a almost. very good point. I never thought about that. Thank you, yeah. Chad, for bringing it up. But it kind of did. You know, it's yeah. like a, it was. It might have been the genesis of of the whole thing. What Documentary. Was yeah. What just, was the inspiration yeah. of getting you into photography in the first place? Well, my father was a photographer, okay. and ever since I was just a baby in diapers, he was getting me to pose. And then when I was in grade school. We'd go out on a snowy day and he'd want to take pictures of the freshly fallen snow when it was like 10 below zero. (laughs) And he was so slow with his camera. He was slow with everything. And he would have me walking back and forth to a barn because he thought it was a good photo. And my fingers were freezing. My toes were freezing. And I said, gosh, damn, I hate this stuff. So for years I hated photography. And it wasn't until I got into art school I found out you could do things a little quicker. You didn't have to be slow. Hmm. Well, what that's interesting you say that because it's still in a time of uh, um, analog, right? So you didn't have you didn't have uh, digital photography back then. So when you talk about speeding up, are you talking about workflow, or what are you talking about specifically? Well, you'd have to see my dad how slow he was. It would take him an hour to take a picture. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'd just speeding up to a normal pace. Right, okay. But as as being a doc, documentary photographer started to become important to me, you have to be on the money and in the moment to catch what's going on. Yeah, and let's talk about that a little bit because there's, there's people, you know, social media is a big deal and st- t- telling a story of your day is super important. And you've, you know, you've, mastered that um what when you when you approach a day like let's mm-hmm. say you're gonna go shoot tomorrow and, and i don't know let's say you're gonna go to the fall river and do you know cover the hex hatch do you think about it as if you're gonna write a book do you plan it all in your head you know what your story is gonna be or is it more of a serendipitous thing where your opportunity if you see a moment you you do that moment and then you know if it is serendipitous how do you how do you control it in a way that you, there's still a story arc there? I do have a preconceived idea oftentimes, and that can get you into trouble. But I I do have sort of a storyline in my mind because I've done these things so often. But if you can surround yourself with the action and be susceptible and open to what's happening, sometimes you go in a totally new direction. 
and capture that one photo that made the difference. Yeah, and that's the thing. With video, you can sit back and you can just shoot everything, a documentary video, you know. Yeah. With still photography, you've, you're sort of telling a story in one split second. A frame at a time. And you don't have to carry all that heavy equipment. Yeah, that's another thing is, is about the equipment. You know, we, um, I don't know, like I bought this this big fat DSLR and I, and I intended to just keep it in my backpack the whole time while I was fishing and take photos <laughs> and do this and fish and take more photos. And you either end up doing, doing one or the other and it's usually fishing. Yeah. How, do you, how the hell do you balance it? Because you, you know, you do both. You have to put the do fly you, rod down. Yeah. You have to. Well, I'm, that's interesting. I'm glad you asked that question too. So for maybe 15, 20 years, I said, you can do both. You just have to know what to do when. Right. And I practiced that. Now, having said that, in the last few years, I would have to say that photography has become a little bit more important to me than the fishing. It was maybe 50-50 before. Maybe it's 70% photography, 30% fishing, because I know I can catch fish. And the challenge of making a good photograph has become, has sort of eclipsed the fishing. Um, but now that I have the desire or the fortitude to put the fishing rod down, my photos have been better. So it's not really true that you can do both to a hundred percent. If you're willing to put one down, you can concentrate even more fiercely mm -hmm. and intently and do a better job. Mm -hmm. So for 15 years, when I said you can do both, you just have to know what to do when that's true to a certain degree. But if you really want to go to the apex you got to pick one or the you other. You do one or the other. So now, I still like sense. to do both, and I just go out and go fishing on a day and don't take my camera. And then, obviously, today I did a cattle, I photographed a cattle drive, and I didn't have my fishing rod, so you can concentrate, and that's a thing. So after Fly Fishing Magazine bought those photos, that's what you did for the next Yeah, I told my friends years. I was going to be a fishing photographer, a fly fishing photographer, no less, and they said, what? What yeah. the hell are you talking about? <laughs> There's no <laughs> such thing. And in fact, there were only maybe three or four other photographers at that time. Who were they? It was Dale Spartus, Tom Montgomery, two or three other guys that I can't remember right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But in those days, because that's been 20, that, well, that's shit, that's been 40 years ago. Christ. Anyway, <laughs> there were lots of magazines and not many suppliers. And it was just black and white film. Okay. And because I had learned to make Black's black and white's white in a professional dark room in art school. And these other guys hadn't really. Uh, They're going, oh my God, look at these prints. These are Ansel Adams. The blacks and the whites are zoned. And they're, they're almost print ready. They're ready to go. It's exactly. Last post production exactly. we have to do. Let's hire this guy. Yeah. So they said, we'll take them all. Yeah. Okay. So that gave you the edge, basically. A little bit of an edge, you know. Yeah. And it's interesting because you've been through it, you know, you've been doing this for 40 years. Um, you've seen the entire evolution of, of the industry, you know, from film to SD cards. Can you kind of talk about a little bit about, you know, how your, your workflow has changed or how, how you approach photography? Has there been any changes? I mean, I personally, I feel like if you got a roll of film, there's, there's almost like this, this scarcity to it, right? So you, you only have. X amount of photos you can shoot. Therefore, I better be very intentful yeah. about on every time I, I push yeah. the button. Yeah. Whereas now, yeah. I can put in like a 10 gigabyte SD card and put it on blast and just And that's what a lot of people do. Do you still shoot film? No, them? I don't. I still have some film cameras, but they, yeah. I collect yeah. the dust. At this so point. can you kind of talk about a little bit about sure. it, how technology has impacted your career? Sure, yeah. Well, like you just said, in the early days, the big thing was film. It was damned expensive. You know, yeah. it was like $10 yeah. a roll, and I had less money then than I do now. And it was like, <laughs> crime we better not shoot very much. And not only that, you had, uh, film is very contrasty. So when you're outside in the outdoors, you're often in a contrasty scene. So you've got blacks with no shadows, with no definition and whites that are burnt out. Like just stuff blown out and, and you can't really do much with it. Do much with it in post. Yeah. But you go back and you look at the old magazines, like we're talking about 1975 to 1980 in black and white before they even went to color. They were pretty crummy photos. Mm -hmm. They were not creative. They were they, compared to today's magazines you look through, or not even magazines, just anywhere. Quality has gone up five hundred percent because of competition. 
and digital. Digital's great because, as you know, you, you can post. you can move everything post in post. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you, um, when when did you just stop using the the old the old style and move over to digital cameras? Like what year? Oh, it's probably been ten years ago. So it's probably okay. you know nineteen uh, two thousand. What are we? 2010. And then are you using Lightroom in post? Yes, yes. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to give up that film. They were no, in love with, I know. They were in those, love with it. Yes, that's true. And yeah. it, it, but you know, there's a setting in your on your, in I think it's Lightroom that you can make your digital look like film grain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what's your What's your oldest piece of glass that you still use today? Oh my God, Chad. <laughs> I, I this have one. Gets back to the the. Yeah, yeah, the natural look, right? Like you can yeah, still well, use your vintage glass. I, because on. I grew up in a poor family, I keep everything and I take care of everything. I still have glass prime lenses that I bought, you know, in 30 years ago. Yeah. Manual that still work. Yeah. Fine. And do you still shoot do you still shoot with those consistently or Yes, yeah. yes those I do. fixed low light? Yes, they are. Yeah. yeah. And What's that mean? I don't know that that term. Well, th- f-stops oh, okay. a lot of people don't know about f-stops today because you don't need to you know with automatic you just point and shoot but f-stops are really important you have shallow depth, depth of, field. of field yeah that's yeah in the old days ansel adam was f64 and be there so that <laughs> meant you have a little tiny hole and everything is in focus it's tack sharp right now all through. Yeah, yeah 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 and they'd use a tripod nowadays You've got faster lens, and you can shoot it wide open at like f2, and so everything but your eyeballs, if you're taking a portrait, is out of focus, and that's sort of the in vogue look now. Yeah. And being a good photographer is knowing your camera and, and how much of that depth is going to be in focus when you're taking that taking that photo, exactly. right? And that's a hard yeah. thing to think about so, when you're out in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about depth of field in terms of composition and storytelling. Ooh, that's challenging. Um, well, I guess I guess really there isn't a big connection because the depth of field that I'm using is a shallow depth of field right now. I'm still telling the same stories. I'm just getting your I'm getting the viewer to focus mm-hmm. where I want him to where is I to be. And everything else that's not in focus is soft and it sort of becomes impressionistic. I don't know if that answered your no, question. No, it does. I I think my takeaway there is like it's kind of like a flashlight. If you're gonna you're gonna put your light on some part of a kind of lowly lit room yeah. to draw attention to it, yeah. you use depth of field to do it. Yeah. Well, you're become the eye. Of the you're the you're the eye. You're the yeah. older. You get to pick what you want your person to look at. Right. And, That's exactly and you get to right. Control that. But you that ask ninety percent of the photographers today, not professional photographers, but maybe semi-amateur or semi-professionals and they have no idea about f-stops they just don't know you know a a small number like f2 is a wide hole a wide aperture a wide opening Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and a big number like 64 cameras don't even have lenses don't even have 64 now is a small hole so it's sort of the opposite of the way you think it would be counterintuitive yeah exactly allowing more or less light to come through your camera correct yeah yeah. Um, what? So I, I, I know we're going to go somewhere else with this, but I wanted to ask, you know, when you're looking, because I have, the, I struggle with this still, and I, I try to take a lot of pictures, but when I've got like a big fish, a bigger fish that I'm holding up, cl- you know, close to the water, trying to get his head and that person, right? Because you're holding that fish out maybe a little bit, all in focus can be tricky and because and, and, you get caught looking at the fish only. Well, some people and, don't want to do that. Some people right. just want to get the eye of the fish in focus and everything right. else out of focus. Right. My big beef today is everybody's holding their fish out at out. arm's you length. You don't like That's that forced going. perspective thing? Huh? <laughs> you don't like the forced perspective thing? No, I think we should just hold them regular, you know? I just don't think we should put our arms out as far as they'll go to make a 12-inch fish look like a 24-inch fish. I agree fish. with you 100%. But it doesn't matter because everybody's I'm, doing it I'm anyway. I'm still going right? to do it. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just look at the hands or look at the fingernails. I know. But you can do all kind of things, so you have to think in your mind really quickly – do I want the angler? I mean, do I want Nick as well as the fish to be in focus or, or the, you know, or do I just want one or the other? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And all that goes through your mind in a split second. I don't even have to think about it right now. How um, about, oh, yep. oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say of all the things that I may be good at, the two best things that I get complimented on is composition. And that was drilled into my head from many classes in art school. The rule of one-thirds. Yep. 
Dominant, subdominant. So you see that scene. You see what that photograph should look like before you even take it. Immediately, yeah, yeah. immediately. Do you, do you have your grid lines on at all times, or do you? No, no, but I have grid lines on sometimes. Not usually, though. And then what did you say? So dominant, self-dominant? Is that what you said? Dominant. What is that? That's I've the, never heard that. That's what takes up the most of your picture. Okay. Subdominant is the barn that's over here in the background. Okay, okay. And the accent would be, I guess... I like guess if we're talking about fish, if fish, it would be the dominant, but just on a regular scenery, the dominant area would be whatever is the sky and the ground. Okay. The barn would be subdominant and a farmer standing back there on his tractor would be the accent, dominant, subdominant accent. Okay. Interesting. You do it enough and you just intuitively know Yeah, that. I don't even yeah. think about it anymore. It's yeah, it's amazing. It's probably really hard to technically explain, <laughs> you know, once well, that's, you, you've done uh, it yeah. for so my, long. You know, my grandmother was an amazing artist. Amazing artist. Really? She could, yeah, fantastic. She, what, what, what kind of art? Uh, water, watercolors oh. and pastels. Really hard stuff to work with. Yeah. And she was really good at getting it down on paper mm -hmm. and taking her that picture in her mind and, and putting it I, I can't draw a stick figure to save my life yeah. well that's kind of why I got into I know, photography because I, I can't to, either yeah. I know I can see that there, picture and what it yeah. should look like yeah. that composition when you freehand exactly. something exactly. getting a sense of scale down to get scale correct is very very difficult and people either can do it or they can't yeah. it's something you're born with I don't think you can learn it yeah. Yeah. I think being a creative artist is more pure and maybe more creative than a photographer I think mm. that's my own personal view, but to be able to draw and paint like watercolor or to draw a figure like Michelangelo is really an incredible talent yeah. where with the camera and especially with documentary, you can just surround yourself with the action and then try to create a storyline and good yeah. composition. Did you make that a point in your life is surrounding yourself with yeah, experts it, it, to yeah. get yeah. that good photo? You've said that, that you've said that twice. So surround yourself with the action i've actually heard that used in this context um i was watching like a discovery or something and it was a wildlife photographer and he said the same thing like and and i've also heard in a hockey context like wayne gretzky said i never i never skate to the puck i always skate where the puck's gonna be is that like what you're getting at <laughs> yeah 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 so it explain is. to us like how in a fishing context what do you look what are you thinking like how do you get yourself how do you skate ahead of the puck well i'm floating down fall river and i know where the good spots are more or less it okay. depends okay so i'm miles ahead of everybody and i know when they get to this spot they're probably going to get a strike so i'm also okay. looking at mount shasta so i'm trying to line that up in back of the boat Okay. Those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, Nick rows rows drift boats sometimes, and and he he's always like looking downstream and setting up the angler for the next thing. So nice. I think it's similar, right? Sure. Yeah. No. One hundred percent. If you yeah you know like you think about all the pictures you've taken, you're like, wow, it'd be really cool to get that shot to take yeah. that picture and it's a hard picture to take because I got to be here at the, this time with that person lined yeah. up just like what he's talking about. And if you can make that all come together and you get that picture. So you can do that. You can set it up. If you have the budget, you can set everything up. Right. The state, you're talking about a stage shot, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can make it look real if you have yeah. the budget. I mean, I could name quite a few people that I admire that do that, and they do a great job. Or you can kind of anticipate and, right. and move yeah. to where you think it's going to be And I think good. most of our listeners are going to fall in the latter category. Yeah. Where, you know, yeah. They're not going to have huge buzzers, but right. they want to do something that looks cool. Right. Um, Talk about fish yeah. handling when you're taking pictures. Oh, about what? Good one. Fish handling when you're taking pictures. Fishing what? Sorry. Fish handling. Oh yeah. Well, because it's good that's to, a that's yeah. a big issue, right? Is it There's easier to take a picture of them when they're dead? No, that's not, <laughs> that's what, it is. <laughs> well, I I haven't even told you about frontiers yet, but that's where I spent 20 years of my life, and dead fish were very prominent then. Oh, that okay. was sort of especially with Atlantic salmon in those days. The good old boys mm -hmm. hammered everything over the head. Yeah. And so it was pretty easy to catch a dead, get a good picture of a dead fish yeah. for sure. But these days they, you know, it's the ethics are keep them in the water mm -hmm. and you don't even have to take them out of the water. You can keep them in the net with barbless hook, slip it out. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting to, when I look at some of your photos to, um, see Hodgman's and, you know, black and whites and cane, you know, bamboo fly rods. And then now, 
being taking pictures, you know, it's it's just such a transition. Well, that, they say that you've experienced, yeah. you know, does the, that? The, yeah, for sure. They say that the key indicator is sunglasses. Sun. <laughs> I've heard that many times. You can tell by looking at somebody's sunglasses what year, what vintage they are. Uh, <laughs> Whether the big like round that. glasses are in. Remember right, the little yeah. beetle in lenses yeah. were big for a while. Yeah, yeah. Has has your photography changed though throughout those times? Like, yeah, it's gotten a hell of a lot better, <laughs> and that's competition. You know, right. when these guys, when we went from five photographers to hundred and five, yeah, you had to step things your game got up. it sets your game up, yeah. way up, way up, yeah. way up. And I remember, you know, uh, my girlfriend Susan, Susan Rockrise, uh, she said, Val, try to take some creative angles that haven't been shot before. Well, that's pretty hard because you've got thousands of people yeah. trying to get an angle that nobody shot before. But it can be done. You know, you can put your spin on things. My, one of my art school teachers told me that it's okay to try to duplicate a picture if you put your own spin on it. And when you say spin, are you talking about just the angle? The angle, the lighting, the moment. The artistic. All those subtle little artistic yeah. In you know little small things that mount mount up, all intentional, but they don't seem intentional when you first yeah. look at them. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you've been all over the world and and taking pictures. What's a what's a good story that stands out to you that well, you'd like let me, to share with let us? Let me tell you, please, if I might, how I got into this. After I got to Hat Creek and I became a fly fishing photographer, I started coming up here from San Francisco, where I lived, in a little dinky, dark apartment. Used to drive up here on the weekend just to fish Hat Creek wow. and Fall River. And I did that for quite a few years. And then I went to a fishing show in San Mateo, uh, International Sportsman's Exhibition. And I heard through the grapevine that there was a new travel agency starting up in Pittsburgh called Frontiers International Travel. And they were looking for a photographer. And I might consider going back to interview with them. So that Monday, the next Monday after the show closed, I bought a ticket and I flew back to Pittsburgh and I interviewed uh, Mike and Susie Fitzgerald, who have now passed away. And they said, yes, we are looking for, we are starting up a travel agency specializing in fly fishing and bird shooting worldwide. And we are looking for a photographer and we'll try you out. Would you like to go to Christmas Island next week? And I, did, my arm. I didn't even know, I'd never even heard of Christmas Island. I didn't even have a damn passport. <laughs> <laughs> but I got one pretty quick and I came back and they said, these are great. Your blacks are black. This is black and white. Yeah. Your whites are white. These look like Ansel Adams prints. We'll hire you. Would you go to Norway next month? Sure. So for, I worked for frontiers for 20 years, 18 wow. years and went through four passports. And sometimes they just expanded my horizon from, a little country bumpkin yeah. fishing locally to the world. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, out that that twenty year job. What was what was more valuable to you, the places you went or the network that you built along the way? I'd say they're both pretty valuable. Okay, I'd hate to pick pick one over the other. They're they're even dead heat even. Doesn't matter if you have that network if you don't have those memories. Well, I well more than the memories. I have the memories, but I also have the slides because they were films. It was black and white film for a while. Then it was color slides. I still have boxes of boxes of those at home. Um, and then I met a lot of people. I met people yeah. in Iceland or in Argentina that said, "Hey, Val, you work hard. Would you why don't you come down next week? We'll give you a free trip." So for years it was free trips, but it wasn't money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for a while, you that's know, okay. that's okay for a while, but then you can't eat jackets. So you got to like do something about that. So, yeah. Um, what, how did you transition to, to turn it into a job? Ask for money. Like a, a pain. Yeah. 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 Well, I just said, look, I've given you a lot of time and you're getting some good material and right. yeah. I need to get paid. And so it's sort of gone full circle, you know, I went from making nothing to doing pretty well to doing very well, but now we're back to digital with 5,000 photographers submitting right. their work for free just to get published. So for instance, uh, I, like Orvis catalog, um, please excuse me, Perk, if you hear this video or this audio, but an Orvis catalog used to pay 1500 to $2,000 for the cover. That was 20 years ago. Now it's about half that. 
and it's and it's attributed to just there's more competition. Yes, more content out there. Yeah, yes. great grab yep. from. Yep, you can post a picture on Flickr and somebody could buy it for yeah. five bucks. Yeah. yeah, I have photo essays in two really nice magazines right now: Fly Fish Journal and uh, Swing Magazine. Both and great. Yeah, Swing okay. doesn't pay anything. Wow. Fly Fish Journal pays like two hundred dollars for a double page spread. Wow. So you can't really make money from for editorial. So a lot of the big shooters went on to doing um, commercial. Yeah, I was going to ask. That was my next question. Is like, how do you guys the the you know the the elite? How how are you guys monetizing in this day and age with all the competition? Well, I have a friend of mine that lives in Sun Valley, and he's just starting out, and he's doing some pretty good stuff. And he's not going to be. He's got a family to support. He's not going to be able to support him other than his guiding. He makes more money from his guiding than his photography, I think. But I told him, you know, you should, if you, you should break into the commercial market if you want to make some more money. And, for instance, go to the Sun Valley Association the Ski Mountain and just apply for some, you know, public relations work. Mm-hmm. And that's a big step up from editorial fishing. That's probably the lowest in the whole <laughs> fly fishing editorial is the bottom of the heap. But you do get to see your good photo credit lines, and that's kind of fun. Hmm. Are you still a, a trout guy? Is trout the the number one species that you like to chase after all chasing all these species around the no, world? No, I mean What's, that's here because I'm older yeah. now and I like our place up here in Fall River and it's beautiful and yeah. this is where I want to spend my last days and trout it is. But you know, I was just in Bolivia fishing for golden dorado and oh, what was that oh. like? That's probably the best trip I ever had in my no, life. Really, I've been there three times. Really? You've got golden dorado, which were are very aggressive. They jump. They take fly very well. So it's They're like a top beautiful. water thing. Yes, Can't you've be. got the indigenous people running around with bows and arrows and loincloths right. that are friendly. They're not head hunters, and you got the flora and fauna of the jungle, and it's just set to good five star lodging. Wow, Damn, it's expensive. I couldn't afford to do it on my own. It's one of those cases where they traded me mm-hmm. subsidized images. yeah because yeah. it's deep That's cool you're deep into the jungle when you do, yeah. just to get there is it, it is it is, it is for sure for sure there's a lot of places like that what do you what's a what's a rig you're fishing on there like you know just like just line, be like striper line fishing setup. be like striper fishing here almost it's like a ni- with eight, streamers. eight nine weights yeah 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 God, yeah sounds fun. eight nine weights yeah, yeah. And then but you're, you're you're stripping like poppers and stuff yeah and and, and oh, deceivers shit. yeah and, and the they ju- and they just ravage it you got to use wire leaders yeah Holy they break teeth. your rod got what? Teeth. big mouths we don't have golden dorado up here in the north they, they're yeah. down in south america and they are an un are they anadromous yeah to yeah. down there yeah but not up here i yeah. have no idea why but they're beautiful they look like um like nothing i've ever seen before they're like inca gold little red stripes yeah. on their Good tails. description that's, yeah uh, that's cool but they're extremely aggressive, and they get to like 20, 25 pounds, and it's oh, just a heap of fun. Just, just rockets. They're that freshwater. Was, that was the last thing yeah. I expected you to say, to be what, honest. What? Just the Golden Dorado, just that uh, yeah. trip. Well, oh, you know, sweet. any kind of fish that'll take a fly is pretty fun. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. down fishing for permit in the Yucatan last month, and I didn't catch one. <laughs> Right. And I said, this permit fishing is kind of sucks. Tough. It <laughs> sucks, man. <laughs> Five days and yeah. no permit. You know, maybe yeah. I'll just stick to bonefish. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny how everybody gets on different. You know, they people, get people want what they don't it, what they don't get. Absolutely, have. always. Yeah, I'm kind of like my dog. He, Michelle's got this big this big pile of toys in the corner, and I've watched him during the last thirty minutes here go over and grab six different toys and then just walk off with them, put them down and then go back to the bucket. Cause he just never satisfied. <laughs> he's, he found when he's destroying this. And everything. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's great. I went to India a couple of years ago. That was an intense trip. I went with uh, my girlfriend, Susan, and we flew into Delhi at three in the morning and get off the airplane. And it's like, there's beggars and religious men and cows and cripples. And it's like a site for, you know, you're ready, of humanity. you're ready to get back on the plane and leave. But we're trying to catch golden masir, which are in the Whoa. carp family. Okay. Or and is that's it fresh another, water? That's freshwater okay. exotic fish. So I guess if you if you go through life and you've caught trout and bass, yeah. you want to experiment with yeah. what else is out there. That's crazy. Okay, so is it is it really light light gear? Light no, that stuff that's at eight and nine too. Okay. Most of the exotic stuff is eight, nine and up. 
<laughs> That's cool. My friend was telling me that there's a there there's a Dubai's got some sort of salt species just off their coast. That's, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's really that? hot there. I don't think yeah. I want to go there. I forget the, what they call them. It kind of looks like a there was a fishing a show bit. about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They catch them right there in the bay. Yeah, I haven't done anything Sky too exotic in the background. Well, it used to be trout was exciting enough, but everybody the boundaries have been pushed. So yeah. now people are looking, yeah. and magazines are looking for articles that about things that haven't, you know, aren't yeah. on mainstream. Yeah, going down I'm, to Madagascar, being chased by yeah, pirates. Yeah, and, yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm doing <laughs> kind of stuff. I'm doing Mako Shark in two weeks with Conway Bowman. Oh, I've done that. You have. I have done that. I have some Mako Shark pictures. Are, with was him. it a positive experience? Yes, it was. You caught one then. Uh, no, we caught no. some blue sharks. We okay. didn't catch a mako, but we saw them. We had them up. But to a the, shark would be cool. Yeah, just yeah. To see. One of the highlights of that trip was we're out in his little boat and we're concentrating on the back of the boat. And here comes this super tanker, which like a, is like, like a boat or a, a, a shark. No, like, like a boat, like a ship. Like a, yeah. This thing okay. is so quiet. And so big, the bow wave was like pushing Dude, us over. It was yeah. like tsunami, but we didn't even see it coming. We looked around, we went, oh my God. And he was still like an eighth of a mile away. Yeah, but, it, it's, you know. it's really crazy to see how much water they push. Like I've been in the Delta and their, their wake is crazy. It's not really a wake like you would be on the river wake. Right. It's just a big swell. Right. And yeah. it comes through and you're yeah. like, holy smoke, that thing's pushing some Yeah, water. the ocean is really something, you yeah. know. I mean, that's expect the unexpected out there for sure. Yep, 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 for sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to that trip, though. It's gonna Mako be Sharks with Conway Bowen. Yeah. <laughs> He's a cool guy. Yep, we had him on the show. Yeah, nice. For a it, minute. Any scary trips that you can think of that? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, that trip to Bol- Bolivia, Chimani Lodge, we, Susan and I were in a dugout canoe, wooden big, 15 foot wooden boat with six people in it. This is to get down to the Golden Dorado. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, it had just rained and it's a little river. They have several rivers you fish, but this one was small. But it had rained and it had a couple of pretty big rapids. And we're pushing upstream to go to the headwaters to look for Golden Dorado so Susan could catch one because she'd never caught a big rip snorter like that. <laughs> and I was so excited. So we're going rip up snorter. this particularly big rapid and. It had just rained the night, a couple nights before, and there was water in the gas tank. So the guide gave it the gas, oh, no. gave it the gun, and it stopped. So here we are in the rapid, sideways with no power. Oh. So the boat flipped over. Everybody's in the water. All six people are in the water. I got swept to one side. She got swept underneath the boat and hit her head oh, no. and gave herself a little concussion on the top of the wooden, on the bottom of the wooden dugout, which flipped over. And we both both about drowned. It was pretty scary. It was. I thought I was. I had a big pair of Sims wading boots on, and I'm a pretty good swimmer. But they were just pulling me down. Swim and, sinking boots. Huh? Swim yeah. Swim yeah. sinking but boots. Stupidity. I had my camera in my hand, and I'm trying to save it. So I'm holding it up over out of the water. Trying to swim in wading boots, which is impossible. That didn't work. And I thought something's going to happen here. And about that time, I felt one of the guys grab my collar on my shirt and pulled me to shore. And the same thing with Susan on the other side. And of course, when we got out, we joked about it, but we were really shaken up. Sure. Water's scary. Um, Yeah. I'd like to do a book on, on mishaps lifetime of mishaps i've got five or six things that well, if were you've got, pretty scary if you got enough for a book what's another one well we were in uh, alaska one time and they had a hurricane up there we're out fishing on the brooks lake and we heard it was supposed to be a big windstorm come in but nobody was really worried so all of a sudden the wind's getting picking up and and long story short we had to cut our we couldn't wade anymore because the waves in the river were too big. So we walked back down to the to the lake and radioed to get picked up. And the pilot said, well, if I can get in, I'll pick you up. Otherwise, you're going to have to camp with the bears. So we weren't too worried. And we sat there. And about an hour and a half later, the beaver plane came flying in. And he was rocking and rolling. And he landed in the shelter of some trees. And we had a little conference as to whether we should try to make it out or just spend the night. Mm. And to Susan's chagrin, she's still pissed off about this, rightfully so. Too much machismo. And they say, well, we can make it. Let's go. So we get in this beaver plane, which is a pretty strong plane, and we took off. And as soon as we got above the tree line and the wind hit us, that thing was shaking like an earthquake. 
I was saying the Lord's Prayer. Susan was passing out puke bags. I looked down at Brooks Lake, and the white caps were like eight feet, ten feet tall. Jesus, and I had a similar experience. The pilot got. We got back okay, and he landed. and He said that was as rough of a trip as I've ever flown. Yeah. I flew uh, over from from Chico to Las Vegas, and it was in the it was in the winter, and we went straight from Chico to Las Vegas, and you fly directly over line of sight right over Tahoe. And we got into some of the worst turbulence that I've ever been in. And the pilot, he's got 2,000 hours flying, and I've got 15 with him. And he said it's the worst he's ever been in. We were having like 10, 15-foot drops. Like, it was awful so i can only imagine yeah so I, I, was, I was terrified oh yeah i hit my head on the on the roof really and cut it, it oh. there was that much turbulence and i wow. was cranked down pretty good on the wow yeah another time we were coming into the ketchikan airport in alaska alaska's got horror stories galore <laughs> and we're flying into ketchikan which unbeknownst to me has is noted for its bad weather yep. and it was foggy and windy and it's a side blow and we couldn't land. So he took off again and he makes a circle and he said, I'm going to try to land again, but if I can't make it, we're going to have to fly on down to someplace mm-hmm. else. So we're coming in and everybody's like white knuckled, you know, cause it's really, this is it. Yeah. And yeah. you're on a pontoon plane. No, this time it was a commercial plane. Oh, a oh big okay. Commercial you're coming plane. into the main airport. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. And, and we're like 20 feet above the deck and it's like shaking like oh. shit. And, and he got it down. And we're, everybody was like, it was scary. What's amazing yeah. with those pilots when they do is when they, they angle the plane. So it's yeah. almost like we're, the right um, fin is kind of sticking forward. It's like you're, he's turned yeah. sideways and the plane's still flying. You know, it's not flying <laughs> where he's pointing. It's flying towards the fin. They're basically, right? they, they <laughs> drift it. They, yeah, they, they drift it until the last possible second. Yep, and, and then, then turn, turn, the, turn it so the wheels are yeah. even with the road and bam, wow. hit the ground. It's yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of horror stories out there, you know, but we're still yeah. doing it. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know, keep, still coming, here. keep coming back. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my friend always says, what, what could possibly go wrong? Ha, 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 like everything. <laughs> when, what, what, uh, I want to switch to gear really quick because yep. um, what gear do you take out when you, when you go typically? It sounds I, like I, I'm going to guess you go light. Yep, light. Light is better. Yeah. I'll tell you a quick story. I was with Lefty Cray one time. He's passed away now, so he won't mind me telling the story. But we're in a boat in Casablanca, and it was the first time I ever met him. And we saw something that we wanted to photograph. And I had one camera, lens, and one body. I jumped over the side, and I ran out and photographed it. And I got back three, two minutes later. And Lefty was still trying to – he had his big Pelican box, and he had three camera lenses, three bodies, and mm-hmm. 16 lenses. And he's still trying to figure out what combination to put on. So less is more. Yeah, and do you take reflectors or any other no, gear out? No, just no. I have all that stuff. But do you, I don't do you use it. a flash? You take yeah, a flash I, I out with a flash you? with me. Yeah. Do you, so, use a, do you use a flash a lot during the day or not? Not a lot. Not a lot. Fill in flash is pretty important though, isn't it? You don't. Uh, not so much with Lightroom now because you, you can fill in the shadows yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And and the other thing that I neglected to mention, aside from being known for good composition, is good lighting. I yeah. I pride myself on doing Rembrandt lighting, like chiaroscuro. Lights against darks and against lights. Mm. So you don't bring anything else to help, uh, like some of that reflect some of that natural light or anything? Nope. Interesting. Huh. And I assume you shoot raw, everything raw. Yeah. 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 No, I don't, Nick. Because I've noticed that in all your pictures in the past, they, it, fantastic lighting. Yeah. Well, I like to make my, thank you. I like to make my, I strive to make my images look like paintings because I like paintings. I think Mm -hmm. like you look at a Van Gogh painting and you can feel the brush marks. You can Mm -hmm. feel what it's like to be in that little cafe or that wheat field. And that's what I want to do with my pictures if I can is get the feeling across. Are you always getting in awkward positions to make that shot? Not necessarily. More it's timing. You know, I was out for the last two nights with a full moon running around in my underwear and my bathrobe <laughs> with slippers at night. On pi- peyote. Um, no, I didn't get any of that. But if you have some, I'll like sign up. <laughs> but I was out at 3 in the morning with my tripod and my camera lens, a camera and a couple lenses, and taking pictures of the old barns with the moonlight. And it was too cool. You get That's the stars sick. and everything. Yeah, yeah. very cool. cool. Yeah. Do you do a lot of time-lapse stuff or l- slow exposure? Long exposure, I mean. No, not so much. No. I can do it, but not so much. 
I mean, except with the water, moving water, I do that. That's yeah. probably the only time. So we kind of interrupted you earlier. You were, we were talking about some old lenses that you you might still shoot with. Yeah. What? Well, I've got a I've got a fifty one point eight. I guess I don't have any really fast lenses because I never had the money to do it. You know, they're expensive. I have a one point eight Nikkor lens that I just bought, eighty five millimeter one point eight. It was like three hundred fifty dollars. My buddy bought a eighty five millimeter one point four. And it was like fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, like more than three times as much money just for that little bit of speed. Yeah, yeah. Sigma's got a fifty that goes to one four, and it, it was sub thousand bucks. Oh yeah, it's like has like has got a Notre Lux or whatever the word in Latin is for night. It's one point two. It's amazing. Or no, it's less than that. It's like point nine five. Oh, wow. I think. Whoa! It's amazing. You can shoot bugs with it. Yeah, yeah. And is that what you're shooting with mostly? Those fixed. Type well, I used lenses. to use zooms. I think you can be more creative maybe with a zoom lens because you have the option to like come closer or yeah. f- pull off. Mm-hmm. But I do like the sharpness and they're also in the lightness of a prime lens. Prime lenses are often lighter than a big heavy zoom. Like physically lighter? Yeah, physically yeah. lighter. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you get to be my age... That's important. If I, I shoot, I've always shot Nikon, but if I was starting all over again, I'd move to like the new Sony's, those little mirrorless yeah. full you, frame. How many, um, how many lenses do you take out with you in the field? Three. Usually? Three. And then what are they? Uh, 24, uh, 85, and 180. Oh, okay. Maybe a 300. No 50s. No 50s. 50 to me is like using a, getting a fly rod. My first fly rod I went in and said to Andy Puyans, I need a rod here now that I'm in California that'll catch steelhead and trout. And he laughed at me. There isn't <laughs> yeah, any. Yeah, a nine and a half seven weight. That was the perfect Well, that's analogy. what I got. I got a seven weight. Nine, yeah, nine, nine foot seven weight. Yeah. <laughs> it took all day to that's get him funny. to commit to that, you know? It's, it's like a 50. 50 is good for certain things, mostly maybe portraits. But your 85 is a portrait lens, so that's okay. fine, you know? Well, I'm seeing a lot. When people are getting into fly fishing, you know, it's, they think about two weights and three weights and four weight, you know, for, for trout. But, it, I mean, it's really, if you get a six weight, you can do all this, you know, yeah. everything. Yeah. And you're going to have just as much fun. Yeah. A six weight's yeah. going to help a, a yeah. beginner perform so much better. I fish better. my six weight more than anything. I think I think men generally are gadget freaks. <laughs> yeah. you know, I think you probably, so. I'm looking at this table <laughs> here, and there's so? a lot of equipment right here. <laughs> you know, fly fishermen are the same way. They got to have that yep. new you special should, deal. You see Chad's fly fishing stuff. Yeah, oh, it's he's stupid. only three years just, in, and yeah. <laughs> I, I need, he needs another yeah, garage. Oh, I know. I, I had an intervention <laughs> with myself last night actually because I was I uh, reorganized every because I I just relocated my entire fly tying thing over to my my place yeah from the office to my place just yeah. to make more room in the office and it took me like six hours wow. to go through everything and oh, stupid. val what's your favorite rod that you you don't like to pull out because you're afraid you're going to break it that you like to well i've like got a couple fish. bamboo rods that i'm so afraid of pulling out to break them that i don't take them out <laughs> <laughs> like pal rods no they're not i have some pal rods but they're not bamboo i have some I, i'm a member of the golden gate casting club in san francisco cool. And you've got different contingencies at the club. You've got the spay guys, you've got the bamboo aficionados, and the regular graphite guys, and the glass guys, and they're all in their own little clique. I was going to ask, do they hang out or no? They hang out in their cliques and drink coffee and eat donuts but every they Saturday. But they don't cross-pollinate ever? <laughs> Not generally speaking. <laughs> so funny, man. They make fun of me because I, you know, I'm sort of rough on my equipment, even yeah. though I take care of it. Uh, I'm afraid I'll break a bamboo rod, and yeah. I, anyway, it's okay. They're too slow. Do you know any people that weird, weird uh, people that do uh, salmon fly tying only? No, no. Did, did you hear about the feather merchant? That book. I know about the book, but I don't. It's a pretty I, crazy story. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it'll make you feel better about whatever little idiosyncrasy you have in fly fishing. It normalizes everybody else. Well, I took some fly tying classes from Andy Puyans, who you guys are probably so young you don't even know who he was, but he was one. Nick of the probably giants. does. He was a giant in fly fishing. He owned a shop in in Pacheco outside of Walnut uh, Walnut Creek. Anyway, he was like the guru, one of the early giants, like Ernie Schwebert and Lefty Cray. And where was I going with this story? I forget. <laughs> okay. If you have a favorite uh, trout fly, 
Oh, no, like I was asking you about the salmon good. flies or something. One fly to go to. Oh, I took some of his classes because he was oh, a yeah. really good fly tire. Like Bob Quigley is a name up here that's yep. synonymous with this area. Yep. And I could see that tying flies is a, takes a lot of time. And I found out yeah. you could trade, you could trade photos for flies. Ooh. <laughs> that was much sweeter, you know? Ooh. You know? If what? you had one fly to go to Hat Creek or a trout stream, what would, what would it be? Quigley Cripple. Ooh. Have you ever heard of those? Oh, yeah. 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 I was with Bob Quigley when he was trying to do a book. He's passed away now. And if you go out to uh, Oak House, the new Oak House Tavern on Upper Fall River, there's a picture of him on the wall that I took many years ago standing there. It's a really cool shot. Anyway, um, he used to tie these amazing flies that worked. They really worked really well. But he just was, he debauched himself. He was always doing any kind of drug that was possible and getting drunk. And he died young. You know, he didn't take care of himself. Hmm. But he was, a, he was a fine, fine fisherman. What about salt, salt water if you had one fly? That's a tough question. Uh, because, deceiver, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Lefty yeah. Gray. Yeah. Lefty was a good guy. You know, that same trip to Casablanca when he was still trying to figure out which lens to shoot, <laughs> he, when that, that week was over, he said, Val, you know, I see you work hard as a photographer. What kind of rods are you using? And at that point, I was using Scott rods because they were from San Francisco. And... He said, well, I'm going to send you a set of sage rods, travel rods. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, that'd be great, Lefty. And I thought, yeah, right. And about two weeks later, they came in the mail. It was a four, six, eight, and a ten weight. Four-piece sage rods. Awesome. Awesome. And I just went, man, this guy's my hero. That's pretty cool. I've heard a lot about him, but I haven't, you know, he's more my time. Yeah, he 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 had a lot of funny jokes. What, so what do you think made him special and such a personality and people, you know, so many people remember? Well, he started off running the Florida uh, IGFA tournament, like tarpon tournaments okay. at a young age. And he became a superstar running that tournament every year. And then he started writing books. He was very prolific. He'd write a book in a couple months. Wow. And he was very friendly, very outgoing. He had a million jokes. He could tell you jokes all hmm. night long. <laughs> and just people loved him. And if you had trouble with something, he would sit down and, you know, just spend time with Cash you. Cash it out. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. Really wonder, wonderful guy. That's really Very cool. much of a chauvinist, but that's, you know, like a lot right. of old guys, you Comes know. Comes with the territory, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Val, for coming on the show and, and talking with us and hearing some of these stories. It's pretty cool. Well, let's, I've, do, I've always, let's do part two. I've always up admired, admired you. your work and um, have looked at it all my life. And Thank you've you. done a fantastic job, and we appreciate you bringing um, these photos and, and pieces of art to in front and, of us for and us be, to see. Be, before we cut you loose, also you have four books published, right? Yep. yep. What can you can we go through them really quick so the folks listening can can maybe grab one and also figure out where to go get those? Yeah. Um. So the first ones, friends. Uh, I can't really see that well. So friends on the water. That's the last book. That's the last one. And that's still. And you, then, you can get them all on Amazon. And then the next one's the greatest fly fishing destinations. Is that what it says? The greatest fly fishing worldwide. Worldwide. That was and the third book. The third one. Second book was trout and salmon. Okay. And the first book, which in many ways is my favorite, because it was distant waters, and like a like a good rock band, their first album is often the best album because <laughs> that's got all their good <laughs> I was shit looking on through it. it earlier. Yeah. It's, it is awesome. Yeah. It's a good. It's a good one. Yeah. You cut all on Amazon. Huh? They're yeah, you can get them all on Amazon. Yeah. Cool. I just want to say one more thing about my significant other partner, Susan Rockrise, yeah. who is the marketing genius behind any kind of success that I've had because I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of not exactly a good promoter. But she was the uh, creative director for um, Apple and Intel. Oh, wow. And so her name's Susan Rockrise. She's a great fisherman, she's very lucky. And I love her to death, and she's done. A, she's helped me immeasurably. That's fantastic. Yeah, behind That's every cool. good man is a better woman. I was just about to say that. Actually, <laughs> you beat me to it. Well, cool. Thanks for coming on. All right, let's go get a beer. Sounds great. For sure. All if right. you guys like this episode, leave us a review. Uh, we'll like be us on. on Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Leave a review. Seriously, send a you guys. message too. Come on, put down put down the toilet paper and leave a review. <laughs> we gotta go. Right. Thank you. 
This podcast would not be possible without support from our sponsors, Fish Bio and Amp.Bill. Fish Bio is a consulting firm that offers a fresh approach to fishery science. They specialize in fish research, monitoring, and conservation with innovative uses of technology and communication. From their offices in Chico, Oakdale, and Santa Cruz, California, to Vien Chen Laos, Fish Bio is committed to solving natural resource challenges locally and globally. Learn more at www.fishbio.com. And Amp.Bill. Amp is a software design and engineering shop located in Chico, California. Amp creates beautiful apps for mobile and desktop devices, wearables, and the Internet of Things. Amp develops native, web, and hybrid apps on a variety of platforms. Chad, who co-hosts this podcast, is the agency's founder. Learn more at www.amp.bill.